Reports lowest daily COVID-19 figures as NCDC confirms 138 new infections. Serb sues President Buhari over failure to publish details of 8 billion Naira recovered news. In international news, protests continue in Kenosha, USA, a week after police shooting of African-American man. And in sport, World Athletics expresses worry over lingering crisis in AFN. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumoke Olatuji. Nigeria's daily COVID-19 figures are gradually declining, signaling that the country may be flattening the curve, even though experts have warned it is too early to celebrate. As the Nigeria Center for Disease Control confirmed 138 new coronavirus cases on Sunday, the country has witnessed its lowest figure in almost four months. The new number of infections has brought the nation's tally to 53,865. 55 of the new cases were reported in Plateau State, followed by Lagos with 15 new cases, another very low record for the state that has always been the epicenter. NCDC says Nigeria has also improved in its testing regime. More than 400,000 of the country's 200 million people have so far been tested. Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Aki Abayomi, has now recovered from the coronavirus infection after testing positive to the virus just a week ago. State Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Benga Omotosho, says after the mandatory isolation, Abayomi took the COVID-19 PCR test and was confirmed negative. Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, SEREP, has brought a lawsuit against President Muhammadu Buhari for failing to reveal information and documents relating to names of people from whom 800 billion naira looted public funds have been recovered. SEREP also demanded for specific dates of a recovery and details of projects on which the money had been spent. In a suit, Sarap is also seeking an order of mandamus to direct and compel President Buhari to instruct appropriate anti-corruption agencies to promptly, thoroughly and transparently investigate alleged payments of 51 billion naira of public funds into individual private accounts in 2019. Sarap is also arguing that the court ought to compel the respondents to disclose the details and whereabouts of the public funds. COVID-19 pandemic has overwhelmed health facilities and services around the world, making it difficult for other ailments to get attention at health centers. Health experts in many countries have advised people to find alternative ways of getting treated to free up health system for the fight against COVID-19. So, many countries, including Nigeria, are turning to telemedicine. Correspondent Kalechi Mekalam spoke to one company that's helping medical workers and patients interact safely at a distance. Yvonne Ndukwe has been dealing with bouts of malaria, but visiting a hospital for treatment hasn't been an option since the coronavirus outbreak. She recently got an alternative, a telemedicine platform that enables her to communicate with a doctor. The platform also links her with a pharmacy around her neighborhood from where she gets her drugs. And the service costs about $2 monthly. I registered with 3,000 naira for three months. And I mean, that is really affordable. Imagine for the next three months, I get access to malaria test and treatment. And then I also get an opportunity to chat with the doctors. We receive prescriptions for patients who have visited an online doctor. Then we fill the prescriptions and ensure that the drugs that we give the clients or the patients or customer is exactly what was prescribed and we, ensure, and we tell them how to take it. The platform also covers chronic health conditions. What happens is we have this set of symptoms. We have an algorithm that we use. We have an algorithm that we follow depending on um, what the patient complains um, about. And with this, we're able to make a diagnosis. Now, if the complaints they have are not one of the diagnoses covered by the telemedicine app, app 
maybe it's one of those that would need a specialist recommendation we offer them a referral template like a referral letter which they can take to another facility or a clinic the platform is the brainchild of health tech firm weller health alongside its health insurance partner reliance it's a pathway that's helping thousands of nigerians access quality health care from the comfort of their homes the partnership has served over 4,000 patients since it was launched some 50 days ago. So it's really um, simple to use. It's just the same way you can chat with your friend or your colleagues at work. Just pick up your phone and, you know, talk to them via text messaging. For people who aren't um, technologically savvy or do not have a smartphone, we also have the facility to connect you via voice to a doctor. It's value for everybody involved. It's value for the patient. They don't have to go to a hospital, they don't have to wait on long queues, they just talk to a doctor, pick up their medications. The telemedicine app was launched in the height of the pandemic. Because of the lockdown, people could not go out, uh, people were scared, a lot of people had this panic about the, the, the pandemic and hospitals were also very, very cautious about who comes into the clinic and who they attend to. So at that period, we were able to provide like maximum value to all our users to minimize the number of hospital visits that happened in that period. Nigeria's fragile healthcare system has been badly affected by the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Reports from the Bureau of Statistics show that about 82 million people live below the poverty line of $1 per day. That's about 40% of the country's population. Now, the telemedicine platform seeks to increase access to health care for middle to low income earners. Coming up, African stories. Two South African police officers arrested for killing teenager who had Down syndrome. And later, international news. Protests continue in Kenosha, USA, a week after police shooting of African American man. watching a welcome back this is in a news Tunisia has made wearing a face mask mandatory. This is in the face of rising coronavirus cases in the country. But students returning to school in mid-September will be exempted from wearing masks. Tunisia's scientific uh, committee for the fight against coronavirus says pupils are less exposed to the risk of contamination than adults. Correspondent Agni Chawoji has more. The decision to make the wearing of face masks compulsory follows an increase in the number of coronavirus infections in the country. Tunisia's health minister says the COVID-19 task force will enforce the new requirement. The new law grants judges judicial discretion. Offenders will be fined by law enforcing agents and courts. They could also be sentenced to jail terms. This period could go up to six months. The state's goal is not to put people in jail. It's rather to convince offenders to wear face masks. The director of the National Observatory for New and Emerging Diseases noted that the emergence of new hotspots in six different regions is due to failure to comply with sector-specific health protocols and guidelines, mainly wearing face masks in public places. People do not wear face masks in the streets and in public transport. They do not respect the health protocol. They still gathered marriages, family celebrations in public spaces without abiding by social distancing. This behavior will only lead to a surge in the number of infections. Many Tunisians have welcomed the decision of the health ministry. I think that offenders must be fined even if the penalties are high. The fine is more than one month's salary. That's how people will respect the prevention measures. Otherwise, only some people will wear the face masks, especially in public transport. Most of those who succumbed to the coronavirus in Tunisia since the outbreak began in March suffered from chronic diseases and had an average age of 69. 
With the reopening of borders on June 27th, Tunisia reported 500 imported cases. The Minister of Health stressed the importance of wearing face masks, washing hands regularly and abiding by social distancing and self-isolation protocol to contain the spread of the virus. Kenya is still fighting the flooding that inundated the Rift, uh, the Rift Valley region. But now, a new rise in water levels in the country's north is threatening havoc there. Calls have gone out to residents to prepare to move or to even begin evacuating right away to avoid disaster. Correspondent Daniel Moy has the details. Nestled in Kenya's northern county of Turukana, River Takwell is rising and rising fast. Levels have reached unprecedented heights as a result of heavy rains. Takwell Dam, which is expected to spill over at 1,150 meters above sea level, has already reached 1,146 meters and is still rising, pointing to an imminent risk of a spillover. We didn't expect this so much. We didn't expect this to happen that soon. But the way the weather changes are taking place, uh, it is very possible that we can have a spill. Uh, my advice to the people downstream in Trukana is that they should be alert and that they should be ready to move. And if possible, they should even start moving uh, towards the high hills. Takwell River supports agriculture through the provision of irrigation, water for domestic use, fisheries and hydroelectricity supply. But with the possibility of disaster due to the dam's expected overflow, county leaders are not waiting for the worst to happen. We have talked to the people and advised them to move to higher, higher ground. So we are monitoring the level of the dam every single day, in fact twice a day, in the morning, in the evening. According to authorities, the move is aimed at avoiding future disasters that could hit the county hard. There are growing fears that the rising water levels could cause havoc in the coming weeks and months unless action is taken and taken now. The spillover, it is feared, could affect more than 50% of the population who depend on River Tackwell for their livelihoods, especially those living downstream. This is a heart-wrenching story of a disabled South African teenager with Down syndrome who was gone down on Friday at Johannesburg Subhaf. Two police officers have been arrested for murder in the shooting that happened in Eldorado Park, a township that has been ravaged by drugs and crime. Correspondent Angelo Coppola has the story. Nathaniel was a Down syndrome child, described as a gentle soul and friendly to everyone. He's not a threat to anybody. Uh, maybe they were busy with the Ill illegal stuff and they thought Nathaniel heard something and they shot him. Nathaniel was gunned down by two police officers just 100 meters from his home. Well, I think the first response would have been shock. So he would have basically been taken by surprise by surprise, so he would have then just maybe froze in his condition, especially since he had a speech impairment. Um, obviously, he wasn't able to express himself as clearly as the uh, officers would have liked him to do. The Minister of Police has promised swift action. The two officers have since been arrested for murder and tampering with a crime scene. Uh, I'm going to court to, to ask him, how can you, some, how can you shoot a Down syndrome 16 year old? How did you get it right? Because still now I can't believe that you shoot my son. The family's loss is immeasurable and they are still in shock and looking for answers. Too much. A big hole. A big hole. Nathaniel was, yeah, he was a golden boy. He was a golden boy. We, can, we can't even imagine what kind of pain I am right now. Just to think of the kind of courageous boy is fighting at that precious moment for his life. It's unbearable. I appreciate you opening up, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Strong. This is a community in crisis, and this latest death hopefully will galvanize the authorities to get the issues sorted out that are facing this community. When we return, international news. 
Protests continue in Kenosha, USA, a week after police shooting of African-American man. And later, sport. World Athletics expresses worry over lingering crisis in AFN. You are watching ANN. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening and of course nigeria is bustling with news day and night that is why ann doesn't sleep our eyes are peeled wide open so no story escapes our radar we stay abreast of world events and happenings at home we keep you up to the minutes in the world of sports we give you information to stay on top of your investment and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website and on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN African News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is in News. Demonstrations against racial injustice continued this past week in the U.S. after police shooting of a black man in Kenosha, Wisconsin. President Donald Trump plans to visit the city later this week, even after the city's mayor had told him to stay away. Chris Brown and Dan Williams reports. Almost a week on since the shooting of Jacob Blake, family members returned to Kenosha to take part in a protest march. Blake's shooting by a white police officer last Sunday sparked a new wave of outrage and fresh charges of systemic racism. Blake remains hospitalized and his family says paralyzed from the waist down. Although the protests have grabbed international attention, investigators of the shooting have so far revealed little about the case. Two officers have been placed on administrative leave but the Blake family says that's simply not enough. My nature is to protect my son, to stand up for my son when he cannot stand up, to ask the police in this town, what gave them the right to think that my son was an animal? What gave them the right to take something that was not there? The Blake family's immediate focus is on finding some sense of justice for Jacob. But their voices have also become a key part of the wider call to end police brutality and racial inequity in the US. Some family members spoke at Friday's March on Washington event and they used Saturday's rally here to again demand change. You stand up and be proud of yourself. You be proud of the black suit you put on every day. You be proud that you are brown. You be proud that it's hard on us. You be proud that we have gone nowhere. We're still here and we stand strong. While the shooting here has sparked days of protests, even a boycott by professional sports teams, the path forward towards significant change remains cloudy as ever. And what was to have been a joyous celebration in a northern Chinese village restaurant on Saturday turned into tragedy when a two-story restaurant collapsed during a local resident's 80th birthday celebration. 29 persons were killed and 28 injured. Correspondent Hu Cha has the story. Rescue efforts at the site of the incident were wrought with danger. The building collapsed three more times while rescuers sought to pull people from the wreckage. The two-story building located in Xiangfen County in the southwest of Shanxi province collapsed while patrons were celebrating a birthday party. Following an incident, many came to help pull victims from the wreckage. Many residents came to help. I heard people in the street yelling, help, help. Some people brought tools with them, like carjacks and crowbars. All the young villagers came to help. We used their bare hands to dig. We pulled six or seven people from the wreckage. 
Over 800 people took part in rescue efforts. Due to safety concerns, the rescuers could only use their hands and small tools in the beginning, so as not to endanger anyone stuck in the rubble. Later, heavy machinery was brought in to help things move more smoothly. The operation ended at around 3:52 a.m. on Sunday. Around 57 people were pulled from the building. This is the city of Lingfen. It's about half an hour drive from where the collapse occurred in the Xiangfen County. Most of those injured in the incident were taken to hospitals here for better treatment. Of the 28 injured, seven have suffered serious injuries, but doctors say they are all in stable condition. An investigation into the cause of the collapse is underway. The tragedy has gotten the attention of provincial officials, who have launched a province-wide overhaul of safety defects in all housing developments and other buildings to ensure an incident like this won't happen again. India's unemployment rate has worsened in light of the COVID-19 pandemic that has decimated global economies. The situation is affecting food security as many in the country now face hunger. Respondents Ravind Bauer reports from Delhi. It is a daily struggle for Ruksana to arrange food for her girls. Gone are the days when the daughters had a nutritious meal at school. Due to the pandemic, schools are shut, depriving them of a proper meal. Sometimes Ruksana has to go hungry to feed the little ones. To make matters worse, she has lost her job as a domestic help. I'm facing a lot of difficulties. I have no job and it's difficult to pay rent. When schools were open, I will leave my children there and go to work. But since schools are shut, I cannot go to work and we stay at home all day. We would bring food from the school. In the absence of any institutional support, urban poor families like Ruksana's depend on charity organizations to feed their children. Experts say undernourishment will be a huge challenge as a result of the socio-economic impact of COVID-19. The UNICEF report, Appending Lives, does make some kind of a projection and we can see from that report that almost 300,000 children under five years of age may die simply because of malnutrition in the next one year. And that's quite a scary figure for us to respond to immediately. In addition to this is the issue of unemployment. Ravinder Debral lost his job during the lockdown in March. Since then, he's struggling to make ends meet and is under huge debt. There are no jobs and there are 10 people looking for a job, but only two jobs are available and the other eight are without jobs. 90% Indians work in the informal economy. They have suffered income loss and layoffs due to the pandemic. This puts them at a risk of falling deeper into poverty. Up next, sport. World Athletics expresses worry of a lingering crisis in AFN. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. Whether in your house, at your office, on your phone or online, we are there. We have the facts behind the headlines. We cut to the chase with the news you really need. We cover every angle. We are the bigger, better news network. We are African News Network. ANN. Watch ANN News on MITV from a truly African spirit. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening and of course Nigeria is bustling with news day and night. That is why ANN doesn't sleep. Our eyes are peeled, wide open, so no story escapes our radar. We stay abreast of world events and happenings at home. We keep you up to the minute in the world of sports. We give you information to stay on top of your investment and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website, 
and on our social media platforms Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN Africa News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News. In sport, Wild Athletics have expressed worry over the lingering crisis walking the Athletics Federation of Nigeria after the court ruling instituted by the embattled AFN President Sheo Guzero against the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development. Wild Athletics made their position known in a letter addressed to the Minister of Youth and Sports Development Sunday Diary signed by Chief Executive Officer John Richon. The world body says it awaits the outcome of the Court of Appeal proceedings to guide its final position. Japan international Yuto Nagatomo is expected to sign for Marcel on a free transfer to provide cover for left back Jordan Amavi. He undergoes his medical examination today, Monday. Marcel's coach Andrea Villa Bose says the club is looking for experienced players. Nagatomo turns 34 next month. He spent seven years with Inter Milan before joining Galatasaray at the start of 2018. Nagatomo has played 122 times for Japan and appeared for his country at the last three World Cups. That is in the news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other stories, visit our website, ANNAfrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANNAfrica TV. I am Olajumoke Olatuji. Have a pleasant evening.